started in uh, talk about the rise of vulnerabilities, exploitation, and threat intelligence. I'm going to hop in the history of vulnerable management, the rise in vulnerabilities, the rise in exploitation, the common vulnerability scoring system, the rise in vulnerability intelligence, and then I'll, I'll talk about stakeholder-specific vulnerability categorization. But I think the, the first thing I always start with is the premise of, like, the history of vulner vulnerability management. Like, you know, typically it has been a function in almost every organization where it's very low priority. Uh, it hasn't been taken much seriously, and there's good reason behind that, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, predominantly focused on CVSS as a priority, and when I'm referring to CVSS, I'm talking about the base scoring system, right? Um, and we'll get into CVSS a little bit more. And for the most part, um, I think the scoring system until more recently uh, with its previous versions in the base scoring even has worked as good enough um, in, in being used for compliance and other things. And then most of vulnerable management was just considered to be the use of network discovery tools and maybe some application uh, tools as well. Um, and, and these things have like drastically changed in the last, I'd say, five years. Um, and so, you know, basically it's like you take Koala's Nessus scanner, you take uh, CBSS uh, and you have a resource to play around with it. And like that was good enough. Uh, and I think the challenge that all these organizations are facing is like that, that that's not it's not really working anymore. Um, and, and I think the important thing there is like, why isn't it working and what's changed? So the first thing I like to, to highlight to people is the fact that there's, you know, the rise in vulnerabilities. Um, there's been a significant trend change. And to, to show, <laughs> I could get better at this, but to show, you know, this is year over year and every single year is another year outside of band, right? From a, um, a circle perspective. So it just shows like exponential growth as far as vulnerability disclosure. Uh, so what a single person team was doing before, right? Trying to triage vulnerabilities has increased, uh, you know, 10, 20, uh, 50 X um, over what it was five or 10 years ago. The additional thing is the rise in vulnerability exploitation. So, you know, I worked at Duo Security for almost a decade. Everything was credential compromised, like almost everything on the initial access side. Um, it was great. Every report, whether you wrote, wrote, wrote the DBIR or you read M-Trends, like phishing, phishing, phishing. And this was the 2020 report with M-Trends uh, highlighting like pretty much everything in the last decade has been phishing credential compromise. Um, so I think it's pretty evident that in the last three years, there's been a change um, in a significant one. In in doing my research, what I realized is if we look at the M Trends report in 2023, suddenly exploits are the number one attack vector. So you know, with the the rise in vulnerabilities, all of a sudden everyone's getting caught with you know they're you know essentially caught in a situation where like they didn't plan for this. Um, they didn't plan for exploitation to be on the rise, and frankly. I think when I joined Nucleus Security a year and a half ago, everyone made fun of me. Why would you go and work in vulnerable management? Um, it's kind of kind of you know evident in the reality that like this was not on anyone's mind and they didn't plan for it. Um, and I think part of it is is like MFA has become more adopted. It's become it's made it harder um, to compromise on the credential side. Not saying that there's still not weaknesses within that, um, but certainly there there are better controls that the attackers are shifting. Um, and then I think the other side of it is, is um, which I'll talk about in a second, is just the aspect of access to public exploits um, and access to public uh, scan data as well. Um, so to, to highlight, you know, I mentioned earlier, most people have used the common vulnerability scoring system the common vulnerability scoring system is the most widely adopted and used, uh, specifically the base score. Um, and enrichment historically has been difficult for most organizations. And as many people point out in engaging on LinkedIn um, or through discussion, like none of the vendors enrich it for customers themselves um, uh, to get to more effective scoring systems and the tools that they use. 
Um, and so reality is, you know, 50, 50, uh, I think it's 56% of vulnerabilities are critical or high in the scoring system that, that uh, is being used, which is creating huge challenges because it's basically a, a scenario of even though there's exponentially more vulnerabilities, uh, we want you to continue to fix uh, even more things, uh, which is a, a big challenge. And so on the data viz side, I, I broke this down and the colorization on this chart is essentially uh, the distribution percentages of CVSS scores. So you can see a seven or higher is pretty much in the middle there. Um, and so CVSS on its own, using it at the base score itself, which is what is in most vulnerability management tools is, is just not uh, an effective uh, way. And I think, you know, Jay, Jay uh, and Scientia have highlighted, like most organizations are able to fix five, 10, maybe 15% of all vulnerabilities. Um, and I, I don't want to discount CVSS. I'm super excited for version four. I think the cool thing about version four that's more promising is that it's much more clear in, in regards to how to enrich it. Um, and my hope is that we will see adoption of version four amongst the vulnerability vendors um, and tooling, uh, because that's going to considerably help people be able to adopt um, the, the, you know, threat BT and BTE score, uh, which is pretty exciting. But not the, not the whole purpose of this talk, just want to highlight uh, some important changes coming. But there's another thing that's really interesting here, which is the rise of vulnerability threat intelligence that, that at least I see and that I've experienced. And you have to keep in mind, like I've only been really playing with vulnerabilities in the last year, even though I've been tangentially involved in, in things that are tied to vulnerabilities. I think even at Duo, we were doing like updates on browsers um, and we would talk about, you know, different vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Um, but it's pretty evident that we see um, a quick rise in vulnerability threat intelligence uh, as we've seen in the past with commercial threat intelligence um, long ago. But the reality is, is, you know, even a y two years ago, there, there was really limited sources in regards to vulnerability specific uh, threat intelligence. And so I think a lot of organizations are searching to say like, okay, there's now some intelligence on things. Where should I start? Um, so you have things like Sysikev, which is the known, known exploitation. You have the exploit prediction scoring system predicting what might be exploited. And then we talked about some of these earlier. You have OSINT sources. So things like Metasploit, GitHub, uh, security advisories, uh, Nuclei. And many of these, I think with the exception of maybe Metasploit, like many of the, like all through, like Kev, for example, 2021, EPSS 2021. So these things didn't even exist two years ago. And most people don't actually still know they exist is the reality. So we're all here in a bubble. <laughs> we're all like geeking out on EPSS, but the reality is, is like the world does not know that this stuff exists and they're just finding out about it. And it will probably take another five to 10 years before they, like we get full knowledge. Now, in addition to that, I think some important things to note is commercial threat intelligence is out there. We should not forget that. There's high value in that as well. Um, and I'm gonna try really quickly to talk about some of the differences I see, but that's things like Mandiant, Intel 471, Gray Noise would be an example, Recorded Future. And nowadays there's probably like a hundred more <laughs> behind that. Um, and so I think you have to question like, hey, what does this commercial intelligence source actually do? Are they just taking OSINT data and aggregating it? Or is there uh, additional value behind it as well? So the first thing I start with is open available threat intelligence. Like I get super excited because Kevin EPSS, uh, this is known exploited vulnerabilities list. Um, this is really important. And when we're talking to a board, uh, we have a lot of CISOs that literally take this sit down with the board and say, hey, do you know every technology uh, company in here? Yeah, we have every technology on this map. Okay, cool. This is CISA, a known uh, you know, government US resources list of vulnerable products. It's not to shame the products, but like if you want to get on the same page of uh, a board that knows nothing about vulnerabilities or exploitation, talk in the sense of vendors because they're going to understand that these vendors are pervasive within uh, uh, your environment. 
And so, you know, generally speaking, the idea is that all technology is exploitable. And the KEV is a great place for organizations to start on things that are known to have been exploited at some, some time. Uh, so think of it as tip of the spear. Um, I did map out at 1.2 NVD to CVSS uh, and I think EPSS as well. But when I say tip of the spear, if you're using CVSS, you, you know, criticals and highs, you're talking about 100,000 vulnerabilities. Whereas at the time when I made this, the KEV, we're talking about 1,000, many of which um, from the base scoring perspective uh, come from uh, lower bands that you would not have fixed. So when we're talking about prioritization and leveraging uh, threat intelligence, this is a really good example of like high fidelity, uh, good value, low hanging fruit that you should uh, go tackle. Um, in addition, like CISA has many other uh, valuable vuln intel sources to opportunely exploited vulnerabilities. All these are on the Kev though, uh, just to highlight. So I'm not gonna go in too much detail. And then you, another uh, open source um, uh, intelligence is Google Project Zero. About 98% of it right now is on the Kev. So, you know, you don't need to aggregate probably unless you're really um, find it important to catch the uh, incremental ads. Usually once there's patches available, CISA then uh, adds those vulnerabilities to the Kev list. Exploit prediction scoring system. Um, distribution wise, like just to give an example or difference between CBSS and I have a better uh, chart on this, but like we can focus on 1% or above and that's 25% of the NVD or actually less than that, I think about 20%, right? So um, gives you much, much better uh, focus and is based on um, actual threat uh, in predicting the likelihood of probability of exploitation in the next 30 days. We, we're all here, so I, you know, I don't need to talk too much about this, um, but I do think important comparison of, of coverage as far as exploitation. Uh, the bottom line is the work effort that you would have to have with EPSS. This changed maybe a little bit. Uh, this is maybe six months ago. Uh, and the top line is uh, CBSS scoring. So you would have to fix a considerable many more things to get to the same uh, percentage of coverage uh, when using uh, CBSS uh, compared to EPSS. Now, the last thing I'll hop in, because we only have a minute or two, I won't go into SSVC, but commer commercial threat intelligence. Um, so, so when we talk about the value of that, that's when we start getting into much, much more valuable information that can be useful when you're in an environment with 10 million, 100 million volumes, like being identified, hey, there's threat actors associated with it. Hey, there's malware associated with this vulnerability. Uh, other context, right, is going to give you the ability to action quicker, faster, or know, you know, and maybe industry specific stuff. So in this instance, this is Mandian's data. And this is threat actors associated specifically with the number of vulnerabilities in the NBD. Um, I think it also highlights, uh, you know, if you just look at the countries, um, you know, where, where we're seeing, uh, you know, cyber attacks in nation states coming from, particularly China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, uh, you know, which is pretty, uh, pretty indicative of the state of the world we're in uh, these days. Um, and then uh, some additional things on the commercial threat intelligence side. I'm using Mandian as an example because we're a partner with them and I can and it's in our product. Um, but, you know, patches uh, or mitigations, right? Um, analysis from actual people. So I think a lot of times vuln management teams and programs do not have the time to analyze every vulnerability. So being able to get, you know, much, much richer, um, uh, you know, aspects of, the vulnerability itself beyond what's provided via NVD or is it exploited or is it not? Um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, I don't think we need to go into SSVC. And then one other thing just that I, th I think is interesting here is this is like a history chart uh, that I kind of created um, that highlights some of the things I just talked about, right? Uh, to kind of show how quickly we've seen the evolution um, uh, change within uh, what I would equate to be the vulnerability, um, I don't know what you want to call it, but the vulnerability side of the world um, and some of the open standards, uh, which is uh, pretty cool to see as well. So that that's my, uh, ho hopefully that's helpful for everyone. That's like my TLDR quick version. 